بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبو القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الله اللهم قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا عبادي الذين أسرفوا على أنفسهم لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The Quran describes three types of souls. One soul Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes as the nafs al ammara. This is the part of the soul that pushes us to obey desires. This is the animalistic side of every individual. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُّوءٌ The soul doesn't just ask once for a person to do haram. Ammara, meaning it is constantly, constantly pushing you to obey the desires, to fall in the animalistic desires. This is one type of soul as described in Surah Yusuf. A second soul is the nafs al-mutma'inna. This is the soul that has attained inner peace. This is the person who is satisfied with God and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is satisfied with this person. Allah discusses the soul in Surah Al-Fajr. Ya ayyatuha nafs al-mutma'inna ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي صلوا على محمد وآل محمد This is the part of the soul that is connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala The person who has built a strong bond with his Lord and the person is pleased with God and God is pleased with this person. And then there is a third soul. And this third soul, third part dimension of a person, this is very necessary in order to go travel from the nafs al-ammara to the nafs al-mutma'inna. How do I reach from the nafs al-ammara, the animalistic side, to being at a level where I am satisfied with God and God is satisfied with me. That is through the third soul. What is the soul? This is the part of the person that is described in Surah Al-Qiyamah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, La uqsimu bi yawm al-Qiyamah, wa la uqsimu bin nafs al-Lawamah. This is the self-reproaching soul. This is the part of every person that feels regret and shame after falling in the haram. And this is a natural gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given every single one of us. If we do haram, maybe the person could be smiling in front of the whole world, acting like nothing has happened, but deep inside, at some point in this person's life, they feel the guilt and they feel the shame. This is the nafs al lawama. This is the self-reproaching soul. This is the gravity that brings you back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with this gift that brings us back to Allah after we have done wrong. And this is a blessing from Allah that He's given us these sensors where whenever we fall in the haram, whenever we do something wrong, we have these sensors that tell us, no, this is wrong. You need to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you have fallen in haram and you feel this guilt and you feel this shame, know that God is blessing you. Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing mercy to you. 
Because if you don't feel the guilt, if you don't feel the shame, then that means you have fallen in so much haram that these sensors, these trigger warnings don't work anymore. You know, criminals, when a criminal commits a crime, the first time they commit the crime, they can't sleep that night. Especially if it's a, an act of oppression, if it's hurting people, they can't sleep that night. Maybe a night, maybe a week, maybe a month. But once a person starts breaking the boundaries and oppressing so much, those triggers don't work anymore. That warning, that sensor does not work anymore. That sensor is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes as the نفس اللوامة لا أقسم بيوم القيامة ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة So we need that to be functioning. We need that part of our soul to work so that we can travel, go on a journey from the نفس الأمارة to the نفس المطمئنة through the نفس اللوامة Now my dear brothers and sisters, one of the ways that this nafs al lawama works is that it tells us to feel the guilt. We feel the shame after we've done something wrong. Maybe the whole world, maybe no one sees it. But between me and Allah, I feel that I've done something wrong. I feel the guilt and the shame. And this is healthy, my dear brothers and sisters. Because if we don't cure our hearts, we will reach a point where the heart becomes so rusted and so far away from Allah, that it can't be cured anymore. Just like a person who has heart disease. The doctor will tell this person, you have 60% cholesterol. You have this much percent of the arteries that are closed. You could fix it right now. But at, one, at some point, a person reaches a level where, where the doctor says, we're sorry, you can't do anything now. Now you need a heart transplant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the sins, they have that same effect on our heart, on our soul. Kalla. This heart, it slowly gets filthy and filthy and filthy. Eventually, this heart is incurable. Eventually, this heart can't be fixed anymore. But there's a method to cure our hearts. Just like the heart doctor will come and tell you, you go and you take this medicine and you do this exercise and you do this, you will be able to slowly fix the damage that has been done to the heart, you could fix the damage that has been done to the soul. Through what? Through istighfar. Through the means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for us. The door of mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left for every single one of us. And that is through istighfar. And my dear brothers and sisters, we are lucky that we have a Lord that welcomes us. That tells us, even if you're a sinner, even if you have done something wrong, you will come back to me and I will give you a clean slate. And I will clean you of all of the wrong that you have done. You don't find this. Right now, with friends, with family, with people around us, one time you hurt them, maybe they'll let it go. A second time, maybe they'll let it go. But after the third time, that's it. They're going to hold a grudge for the next 30, 40 years. They'll hold the grudge. They're going to continue reminding you of what you did. They're not going to forgive you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Allah says, tell this message to the sinners. Tell this to the sinners, الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ Don't give up hope in the mercy of Allah because Allah forgives all of the sins. Every sin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. In another verse, Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ Those who have done a fahisha, a very bad sin. And here in the Qur'an, the eloquence of the Qur'an, refers to fahisha in a sin that has to do with a sexual nature. And this is something that many people fall in. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ Or they have oppressed themselves. ذَكَرُوا الله. They remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ And they repent. They ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah says, وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ 
And who forgives the sins other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَلَمْ يُصِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ And they don't insist on the sin. This is the key point here. When you want to repent to Allah, we can't play games with God. Maybe with people, we can go and say sorry and then do something behind their back, they won't notice. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no room for games. وَلَا يُمْكِنُ الْفِرَارُ مِنْ حُكُومَتِكَ There's no escape from the government, from the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows everything. So let us be real with God. Let us be sincere. Let us not try to play games with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because at the end of the day, it is our future, our eternal afterlife that is determined through our actions. And my dear brothers and sisters, tawbah is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to do. And Allah has not just allowed us to repent. Allah is happy when we turn to Him. The hadith says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَىٰ أَشَدُّ فَرَحًا بِتَوْبَةِ عَبْدِهِ مِنْ رَجُلٌ أَظَلَّ رَاحِلَتُهُ وَزَادُهُ فِي لَيْلَةٍ ظَلْمَا فَوَجَدَهَا Imagine you're traveling. You're traveling, you have your vehicle, you have your belongings, everything with you, and suddenly you lost everything in the middle of the night. You're lost. You have nowhere to go. You can't see anything. It's in the middle of the night. You start looking, you get worried, you start looking, then you find your belongings. Once you find your belongings, how happy will you be? You will be extremely happy because you're going to suffer without it. The hadith says God is happier when we return to Him and we say Astaghfirullah. When we return to Him with tawbah and we do istighfar, Allah is happier than that person that found all of their belongings. And my dear brothers and sisters, when it comes to tawbah, we have to believe that Allah forgives all of the sins. There are a lot of people, I tell them, why don't you come to the masjid? Why don't you start praying? Why don't you go to hajj? Why don't you do these wajibat, these expectations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has from you? Many people, I've heard this person, they say, say it, we've done things that are so wrong that we feel guilty. We feel ashamed to go to the masjid. I can't go and repent right now. And this is a wrong mentality, my dear brothers and sisters. Maybe if we've hurt people, we don't have the face to go to them and face them and tell them we are sorry. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can't have that attitude. Because at the end of the day, you have to go back to Allah. At the end of the day, there's no one that forgives other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is arham al-rahameen. Allah is the most compassionate, the most merciful. In fact, to assume, to think that God is not going to forgive you, that in itself is a greater sin than the sin that you committed. Let me tell you the story to try to understand the concept of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this story is a reality. During the time of Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida alayhi salam, a man by the name of Abdullah al-Naishaburi, he comes to Imam al-Rida and he tells him the story. He tells the Imam something that he has just experienced, he's just witnessed. He tells him, a while ago, I went to visit the governor of Neshabur, the place where Imam al-Rida is buried today, Khurasan. That place is called Khurasan or Neshapur. The governor of that area is a man by the name of Hamid ibn Qahtaba. Hamid ibn Qahtaba. He was appointed by Harun. And then Harun was buried in his village, in his place. And then they buried Imam al-Rida next to Harun as well. So this man, Hamid ibn Qahtaba, he, this man, Abdullah al-Nayshaburi, he says, I went to visit Hamid ibn Qahtaba. And it was like these days, the month of Ramadan. He says, I went during the day, I'm fasting. And I see Hamid ibn Qahtaba, he's sitting and they bring him food. And he starts eating. So I tell him, are you traveling or are you sick? He says, neither. 
I'm not traveling and I'm not sick. So he says, I tell him, then why are you eating? It's haram to eat during the month of Ramadan. He says, he looked at me, he tells me, I've reached a point in my life where it doesn't matter if I fast, if I pray, if I do halal, if I do the haram, it doesn't matter anymore. He tells him, how can you say such a thing? What have you done that now you're not even fasting anymore? He tells him, I committed such a great sin that doesn't, doesn't matter anymore. If I fast, let me fast the whole my whole life, Allah won't forgive me. He tells him, what did you do? He says, one day in the middle of the night, Harun, Harun was claiming to be the Khalifa of Rasulullah. And he ruled the Muslim world. Harun calls me in the middle of the night. He sends his guards to call me and his guard has a sword with him. He comes and he calls me. Harun tells me, Oh Hamid ibn Qahtaba, we have done this and this and this for you. We've served you. We've given you this power. What are you willing to do for us? Hamid ibn Qahtaba he says, I will give you all of my wealth. I will sacrifice it for you. He said Harun was not happy with that answer. He tells me, go. He said, I go, I put my head on the pillow. Then a short while later, I get called once again. Harun wants to see you. He says, I go to Harun. Harun says, oh Hamid ibn Qahtaba, what are you willing to do for us? He says, I will give my wealth and I will give my family and everything that I have for you. He said, Harun was not happy. He sends me back. And then a while later, he says, bring him again. He says, they bring me in the middle of the night and the, ma the guard next to him has his sword in his hand. He said, I began to shiver. Oh, Hamid, what are you willing to do for us? For our government, for our power, for our authority? He says, I'm willing to give my wealth. I'm willing to give my family and I'm willing to sacrifice my faith for you. He said, when I said that, Harun smiled. Once he found someone who's willing to sacrifice his faith for him, do the haram for him, break the boundaries of God for him. He said, is that so? Okay, you see this guard? You go and you follow him and you do everything he tells you to do. He said, in the middle of the night, I began to follow this guard until we entered into a house. That house had a garden in the middle in the old Middle Eastern houses, they had a saha, a garden in the middle, and then there's rooms. He said, we op he opened one of the rooms, and I see 20 men, they're tied up with chains, they're all crammed in this room. He says, the guard gave me the sword, and he tells me, do what you have to do. You have to kill them. He said, I asked him, who are these men? Who are these people? He said, these are the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib. They are the descendants of Imam Ali. He said, I took the sword and I began to kill them one after the other, one after the other. And at first my hand was shaking, then I got used to it. I finished this room. He said, go and take the bodies and throw them in the well. And then he says, he goes and he opens another room. In the second room, there's also 20 Alawiyin, children of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, he gave me the sword and I began to kill them one after the other, one after the other. He said, then we went to the third room. The third room also had 20. I began to kill them one after the other until I reached the last person. The last person was an old man. His eyebrows had covered his eyes because of his old age. He looked at me. He tells me, what are you going to answer? our grandfather Rasulullah on the day of judgment, where in one day you kill 60 Sayyids. In one day you kill 60 from the descendants of Rasulullah. He said, at that point it didn't matter anymore. I killed him and now I've been living my life like this. Now it doesn't matter if I fast. It doesn't matter if I don't fast. It doesn't matter if I pray. Abdullah and Nishaburi, he says, I got up and I go to Imam al-Rada alayhi salam. He sees Imam al-Rida. He says, I tell Imam al-Rida what, what Hamid ibn Qahtaba has just tells me, tell, tell, told me. He said Imam al-Rida began to cry and he says, woe be upon him. Waylun lah, waylun lah, waylun lah. And then 
Imam al he says a statement. He says, إِنَّ يَأْسَهُ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ ذَنْبًا مِنْ سِتِينَ مِنْ قَتْلِ سِتِينَ عَلَوِيَّةِ Imam al says a very powerful statement. He says, him losing hope in the mercy of Allah is a greater sin than killing 60 alawis, 60 saints. What does this mean? This means that Allah is merciful. We have to just turn to Allah. We have to just go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repent and seek the repentance from Allah. And my dear brothers and sisters, these days, these nights, the nights of the month of Ramadan, this is the night to do istighfar. These are the nights to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and change our lives. Because the whole purpose of fasting is not just so that we starve ourselves. Allah doesn't want you to just go hungry. Allah wants you to make a transformation in life, in your life. كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you reach the state of taqwa, so that you change your life. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, how do I know whether God has forgiven me or not? This is a question that a lot of people ask. I did istighfar last Laylatul Qadr, the, the year before that, and the year before that, and we keep doing istighfar. How do we know if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted our tawbah and has forgiven us? The first, my dear brothers and sisters, you will know if God has forgiven you, if your tawbah was sincere or not. This is the scale. If you are sincere, you are genuine in your tawbah, in your repentance, then that means God has forgiven you. If you are not sincere, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not forgiven you. Because Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha. Be sincere when you repent to Allah. Don't play games with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another verse, Allah says, إِنَّمَا التَّوْبَةُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ السُّوءَ بِجَهَالَةٍ Tawbah is for those who commit a sin بِجَهَالَةٍ Meaning that they weren't intending on it. This wasn't something that was premeditated. This was a sin. This was a, a mistake that we did. And we all fall in mistakes. In fact, the hadith says, كُلُّ أَبْنَا آدَمْ تَوَّابُونَ كُلُّ أَبْنَا آدَمْ خَطَّاؤُونَ All of the children of Adam are sinners. Can you find someone who says, I'm not a sinner? Every single one of us, we are sinners. كُلُّ أَبْنَا آدَمْ خَطَّاؤُونَ وَأَحْسَنُهُمْ التَّوَّابِينَ But the best of those sinners are the repenters. So we fall in sin, not on intention. إِنَّمَا التَّوْبَةُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ السُّوءَ بِجَهَالَةٍ ثُمَّ يَتُوبُونَ مِنْ قَرِيبٍ And they repent immediately. Immediately repent. Don't, let, don't give it time to wait. In fact, the hadith says, when a person, when a mu'min commits a sin, Allah tells the angels, don't write down what this person has done. If you've done something good, if you intend on doing something good, Allah tells the angels, write it down. Write it down for him. He's made the niyyah. She's made the niyyah. But if you do something wrong, Allah tells the angels, wait. Give this person time. One hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, seven hours. Now, hours, sa'a, does it mean 60, 60 minutes or does it mean a time frame? I don't know. But Allah says, the hadith says, wait seven hours until... You write it down. If this person repented before the seven hours, then don't even write it. It won't even be shown on this person's uh, report. So here, we have to be sincere. Imam Ali alayhi salam, in Dua Kumail, the Dua that we recite on a night like this, on Thursday nights. وَقَدْ أَتَيْتُكَ يَا إِلَهِي بَعْدَ تَقْصِيرِي وَإِسْرَافِي عَلَى نَفْسِي معتذرا نادما منكسرا مستقيلا مستغفرا منيبا مقرا مدعنا معترفا لا أجد مفرا مما كان مني He says, I turn to you. I am apologetic. I am sincere. I am regretful. I have no one to turn to other than you, O Allah. This is how we have to turn 
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to make promise to change and we have to be sincere with that promise. This is one way when you know whether God has forgiven you. If you see that you are sincere, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you. That means God has cleansed you from the sin. This is one. Second is you don't go back to the sin. Don't go back to the sin. If you want to know whether God has forgiven you, that means this habit has to come to a stop. You have to do whatever it takes to stop these habits. Whatever it is, you know yourself better than anyone else. You judge yourself. You know yourself. You have to stop the habits. And Allah says in the Quran, if you refrain from the kaba'ir, if you refrain from the greater sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you for the smaller sins. In tajtanibu kaba'ira ma tunhawna an nukaffir ankum sayyatikum. If you stay away from the kaba'ir, from the major sins, then Allah will forgive you these minor sins. Now, of course, we shouldn't say, oh, this sin is small and this sin is big. This is up to God to decide. Because if you come and you look at a sin and you say, yeah, this is a small sin, it's okay. This is a small sin, it's okay. Then that means we are belittling the sins. That means we are playing the judge. You can't do that. So, this is one. Live a God-conscious lifestyle and stay away from the muharramat. Another way to stay on the right path and know that God has forgiven you is by changing. You had a bad habit, now start doing a good habit. Start doing good things, do good deeds. إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ When you do a good deed, it will erase the bad deeds that were committed. And there's a story behind how this verse was revealed. وَأَقِمَ الصَّلَاةَ طَرَفَيِ النَّهَارِ وَزُلَفًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ One day a man comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, a young man. He tells the Prophet, I sell dates in the market in Medina. And one day, a beautiful girl, she came and she wanted to buy dates from me. So I gave her the dates at a very discounted price to try to get her attention. And then I gave her a kiss. So he says, now Ya Rasulullah, as soon as I did that, I realized she was married and I realized what I did was wrong. And this is why it's not a good idea to just kiss random people. So he says, I realized that it was, it was wrong and now I don't know what to do, Ya Rasulullah. Rasulullah tells him, do you pray with us, Salah Jama'a? Do you pray with us? The man, he said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. Every prayer I'm here, I'm standing behind you and I pray behind you. So Rasulullah takes a pause. He doesn't say anything. And Jibra'il comes down with this verse. وَأَقِمَ الصَّلَاةَ طَرَفَيْ النَّهَارِ وَزُلَفًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ Rasulullah tells him, go, you're free. God has forgiven you. He said, how? Rasulullah tells him, the Quran just came down. It says, "Wa'akim al-salat," stand for prayer. Tarafe in nahar, both parts of the day. Wazulafan min al-layl, and at night, in al-hasanat, yudhib the sayyad. The good deeds they erase the bad deeds. Sometimes you you do a sin and you say astaghfirullah. Sometimes even if you did not say astaghfirullah, but if you only go and do good deeds, then God will automatically erase the bad that you did. And some of the good deeds that we do are prayers. Prayer, it cleanses you. Prayer is a purifying agent. This is why we pray five times a day. Some people, they ask, why do we have to pray five times a day? Rasulullah tells the Muslims. He tells them, if you had a stream, a river in front of your house, and you go and you wash yourself every day five times, how clean are you going to be? The Muslims, they said, you'll be extremely clean. Imagine someone takes five showers a day. Five times you take a shower a day. So, and I know some of you probably do that, right? So, they tell him, 
will be extremely clean. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi tells them this is exactly what salah does to the soul. Salah cleanses the soul just as the stream of water cleanses the body. This is why we pray five times a day. Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar. Another way, my dear brothers and sisters, to know whether God has forgiven you or not is by constantly remembering Allah and constantly reminding yourself of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when we don't remember God, that means shaitan has come. Stahwada alayhim shaitan fa'ansahum dhikr Allah. Shaitan, he comes and he takes over a person, they start forgetting Allah. You know, sometimes when you're in an unhealthy environment, in an atmosphere that is far from God, sometimes you see, you look at your watch, and you see salah was four hours ago and I haven't prayed yet. And you didn't even realize it. Why? Because shaitan came. He kept you distracted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Stahwada alayhum shaitan fa'ansahum dhikr Allah. This is why the mu'mineen, the believers, they always remind themselves of Allah. This is why it's called dhikr. Dhikr, why is it called dhikr? When, you're, when you keep remembering God. Dhikr is a reminder. You say, dhakirni, remind me. Because you have to remind yourself to go back to God through the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through saying, astaghfirullah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. Having the dhikr of Allah on your mind. And this is the way that we cleanse our souls. This is the way we go from nafs al-ammara to nafs al-mutma'inna through the nafs al-lawama, through the self-reproaching soul. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our tawbah and give us the opportunity to benefit from these holy nights. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. وصلى الله على محمد وعلى آله الطاهرين الله.